Hi, my name is Emil Timothy, and today I'll be presenting Cohn's construction of large USBs. So before I get to what a USB is, let me motivate the context for why this is important. Um, so we start in the context of matrix multiplication, um, where for many years people used to think that the best algorithm that we had was this O of n cube algorithm. But after Strassen presented his O of n to the log base 2 of 7 algorithm, um, we've quickly transitioned to the realm of algebraic methods to push down this constant of matrix multiplication, the exponent, as close as possible to 2, because we do think that ultimately an O of n square algorithm for matrix multiplication would be really beautiful. Um, so in the coppersmith winograd construction of matrix multiplication, where, um, well, m the best methods that they've produced have shown that you can decrease the exponent of matrix multiplication all the way to O of n to the 2.37, um, they use the concept of a USP, which is a uniquely solvable puzzle. And most specifically, the idea is that if you can come up with very large uniquely solvable puzzles, and I'm going to talk about what that means in a second, um, you can push down the exponent of matrix multiplication. So, um, yeah. So, so what is a USP? Right. So, um, uh, a uniquely solvable puzzle, a USP, U. Uh, the subset u of 0, 1, 2 to the k. So it's a subset with k. And uh, you say that u is a USP if there is no permutation on the sub rows. that forms a distinct puzzle. So just to provide a good example for what this means, so let one of these USBs be 0, 1, 2, 0, 2, 1, 1, 2, 2. So Right, so by our definition, we see that this is a USP if there is no way to permute these sub rows to form a distinct puzzle. So let's look at the sub rows here. So firstly, just consider all the zeros. So that would be zero, and then zero, and then nothing here. And then let's look at the ones. And let's look at the twos. And um, yeah, you can see that there is no way to permute any of these rows to form a distinct puzzle. So the idea is that can you switch any two rows and then merge all these back together such that there are no collisions? And in this example, so for instance, let's keep the two sub rows fixed and let's consider what else you can fit in this location over here. So right now, when you merge everything together, it's the one from here that fits in this spot. But let's say that we merge, that, sorry, let's say that we um, permute these sub rows. So we send this one somewhere up here, and then, well, you gotta take one of these two, one of these zeros down. So you get a zero down here. Um, right, but the problem would be that one of the ones from here or here would have to come down and or go up and there's just no spot available for it because every time you move the one down, um, this, move, this one down here, you, you get a collision. Every, every time you move this one up or down, you get a collision um, here. So, so you can see quite clearly that this example is a uniquely solvable puzzle. Right. So I'm gonna switch this now. So, the coppersmith winograd theorem states that the largest USP for any size, sorry, yeah, for any width k is going to be 
theta of 3 over 2 to the 2 thirds um, minus little o of 1 The couples and Winograd construction states that for a width k, the largest USP they can construct has size theta of 3 over 2 to the power of 2 over 3 minus little o of 1 to the power of k. And this is a big claim that we're going to be trying to prove throughout this presentation. So um, how do we prove this? So our work begins with um, Salem and Spencer's 1942 theorem. Um, This is to do with progression-free sets. And the idea is that um, for any M that is large, you can come up with a set B, which is a subset of all natural numbers from 1 to M, such that um, the size of B is equal to, sorry, the size of B is equal to omega of M to the 1 minus delta, where delta is a fixed positive number. And the catch is that um, the reason why this is so useful is that we have that B satisfies the triple product property, or a form of it at least. So more specifically, what, what I mean is that for any three numbers, B sub one, I guess B sub i, B sub j, B sub k, and B, you have that B sub i plus B sub j is congruent to two B sub k mod m, if and only if, i equals j equals k. So now to present the construction of large USPs, um, we're going to choose a very large value of m. So let m be 2 times 2n, choose n plus 1, for some large value of n. So now note immediately that m is an odd number by our construction. Uh, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to sample um, three n different values. So I'm going to write it as this. We're going to call each of these values omega or w sub i. So the first one would be w sub 1. The three n sample would be w sub 3 n. And we're going to sample these from 0 to m. Next, let i define every single subset of three of the first three n natural numbers um, with the condition that i has size n. And of course, just building on this notation, you can come up with the indicator function delta sub i of j, which is, of course, 1 if j is in i and 0 otherwise. So, that's something to note here about these w sub i's is that they denote a natural mapping between i, the set of subsets of um, size n from 0 to 3n, um, yeah, so a natural mapping between i and z mod n. And now I'm going to define three of these constructions over here of these uh, natural mappings. So let the first one be beta sub x of i which is um, the sum of the delta sub i of j, w sub j, mod m. 
from j equals 1 to 3n and then let beta sub y of j be omega 0 plus um, beta sub x of j and then let beta sub z of k be equal to omega 0 plus the sum from j equals 1 to 3n of 1 minus delta sub <coughs> 1 minus delta sub z of j omega sub j all this over 2 mod n and it's worth just justifying why this um, fraction exists mod m and of course the answer is because m is an odd number as we defined earlier. Right, so with these natural mappings we can now start to come up with an algorithm to construct a large UFP. Um, so, we're going to define it in steps. So, step one For our large value of m, we're going to use Salman's census theorem to come up with this set b. And then for every b sub i in b, you can consider triples of the form x, y, z, and of course there are going to be multiple of these triples um, from, I guess, such that x, y, z are in uh, the set i, so they each have size n. And, and specifically, we're going to choose the triples x, y, z such that beta sub x of x is equal to beta sub y of y, which is equal to beta sub z of z, which is equal to b sub i. So we can come up with this natural association between b sub i and these triples x, y, z, along with the added condition that x, y, and z are pairwise disjoint. That is to say that the union of x, y, and z again forms our entire set of numbers between 1 to 3n. The second step would be if you're not given many of these triples x, y, z and you just want to choose one of these. So if you have, um, you know, some number of triples, you're just going to choose, uniformly choose one value of x, y, and z. So by the end of step two, for every b sub i, you're going to have one triple associated with it. And the construction of the USP is now for u, which is a subset from 0, 1, 2 to the 3n, which we're going to let that be something of width k. And then for every u sub i, for every row in this puzzle, it is associated with a b sub i, and every b sub i now has a triple x, y, z. So there is some association, the u sub i implies a b sub i, and vice versa. And for every b sub i, we have a triple x, y, z. And uh, we are going to write that u sub i of j is equal to 0 for all j in x. Similarly, u sub i of j is equal to 1 for all j in y. And u sub i of k is equal to 1 for all j in z. So clearly this actually fills up our grid because x, y, and z, um, when you take the union of all of these things, you get uh, the natural numbers from 1 to 3n.
and similarly repeating this process across every single use of I in U yields a large puzzle. But let's now concretely prove that this is in fact a USP. So to show that this is a uniquely solvable puzzle, um, we're going to prove a claim now. So the claim is that for all I sub 1, I sub 2, and I sub 3 chosen from the first B natural numbers, um, I sub I sub 1, J sub I sub 2, K sub I sub 3 are pairwise disjoint. If and only if I1 equals I2 equals I3. Um, so this claim here, um, proving this claim would be equivalent to showing that our construction is in fact a uniquely solvable puzzle um, for the reason that when you're looking at a specific row U sub i in U, you want to check that every single entry um, is well defined and there are no collisions and that when you permute these sub rows you are going to get a collision so the pairwise disjointedness of these i sub i1s, j sub i sub 2s, k sub i sub 3s is useful to us because it tells us that when you permute them um, you are in fact going to get a collision um, and, and that would be a contradiction to our definition of USPs Right. So, how do we prove this claim? Let's assume that I sub I sub 1, J sub I sub 2, and K sub I sub 3 are, in fact, pairwise disjoint. Then, observe that you can define B sub I sub 1 as beta sub X of I sub I sub 1, B sub I sub B sub I sub 2 as beta sub Y of J I 2 and B sub I sub 3 as beta Z K sub I sub 3. And if you note now by the way we define these natural mappings from I to mod N, you'll see that we have this very clean expression here that just doing the algebra yields that B sub I sub 1 plus B sub I sub 2 is congruent to 2 B sub I sub 3 mod N. But because all these B's are from this set B, we know from Salem and Spencer's theorem that if this is true, then it means that I sub 1 must be equal to I sub 2, and that must be equal to I sub 3. So that proves the claim. So this tells us that we do in fact have a construction for a uniquely solvable puzzle. The question is, is it any good? Um, the reason we're trying to construct these uniquely solvable puzzles is because we want to create very large puzzles for a fixed k. So what is the largest bound we can create for the size of this USP? So to do this, we're now going to use a counting argument. And we're going to count how many triplets we have at every step. Um, and then we're going to use that to bound the size of the USP. So I'm going to now erase this claim. Hopefully have convinced you that um, this construction is a uniquely solvable puzzle. So, for a fixed B sub i in B, let's count how many triplets x, y, z we have after the first step. So we're going to count the number of x, y, z's after step one. So one thing to observe here is that if I and J 
in our big set I, our pairwise disjoint, and if they're mapped to the same piece of I, so, so what I'm saying is if beta sub x of I is equal to beta sub y of j, um, then this gives us a natural way to define k, because we can write k as the first three natural numbers minus the unions of i and j. So fixing i and j as pairwise disjoint um, sets from i in a way tells us what k should be. So we can actually count this probabilistically. Let's look at the probability that beta sub x of i is equal to beta sub y of j, which is equal to some b sub i. So of course, these two events must be independent. So the probability that beta sub x of i is equal to b sub i uh, is going to be equal to the probability that beta sub y of j is equal to b sub i. And of course, the output of these beta sub x's and beta sub y's can really be anything from 1 to m. So, the probability that beta sub x of i is equal to b sub i is equal to the probability of beta sub y of j is equal to b sub i. And this is just because of independence. But to actually complete these probabilities, that would just be 1 over m. So to count the expected number of triplets left after step 1, um, let's count the total number of triplets you could get without any constraint. So that's just going to be from 3n, choose n, n, n. And all this enforces is a pairwise disjointness. And now you're going to enforce that these beta sub x of i is equal to b sub i, and that beta sub y of j is equal to b sub i. And each of these events are independent with probability 1 over n. And of course, doing it for i and j fixes it for k, um, as I said earlier. So the expected number of triplets you're going to have left after step 1 is going to be this. And now to count the number of triplets that we remove in step two, um, let's just look at the x, y, z's. And this is just going to be a purely combinatorial argument. And let's look at every pair of x, y, z's that we have for any fixed b sub i. Let's consider the case in which x is equal to x prime across some pair of triplets. And in this case, the total number of triplets that you would remove would be half times 3n, choose n, 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 times 2n, choose n, minus 1, times m to the negative 3. And just to justify this briefly, um, again, we're choosing sets x, y, and z, so we have this argument over here, which defines the ways you can do that, which is the pairwise disjoint. And, and this term here counts the number of x's that are pairwise disjoint with y and z, such that y and z don't really have a constraint in each other. Um, and then, and we add the half term over here because we're double counting for x and x prime. And uh, so this term here now, we have m to the negative 2 for the same reason as earlier because you're defining a probability that beta sub x of i is equal to b sub i and that that's equal to the probability of beta sub y of j being equal to b sub i. And those are all independent of the same probability 1 over m. But now you're defining the additional probability that beta sub z prime is equal to b sub i. So you get another 1 over m term. And then of course repeating this process for all the y equals y prime and z equals z prime yields the exact same result. So for a fixed b sub i, the number of triplets that you remove would be 3 over 2 times 3n choose n and n times 2n choose n minus 1 times n to the negative 3. So for a fixed b sub i, how many triplets does that leave us with? So for a fixed 
matrix is phi. Well, this is going to be this times that. So 3n choose n, 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 n to the negative 2 times 1 minus 3 over 2 times 2n choose n minus 1 times And now recalling that n is equal to 2 times 2n choose n plus 1, and substituting that over here, you can come up with a good upper bound of this being equal to 1 over 4 times 3n choose n, 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 n to the negative 2. And the algebra here is just, it's not hard. So across all possible values of b, and we know the size of b from Salem and Spencer's theorem, that the size of b is omega of m to the 1 minus delta. Um, we have that the total number of filters that you have is going to be 1 over 4 times 3n choose n, 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 n to the negative 2 times the size of b. And then from Salem and Spencer's, we know the size of b is this omega of m to the 1 minus delta. So this gives us a good upper bound. So let's look at the asymptotic limit now as you let n approach infinity and delta approach zero. So as n gets larger, arbitrarily larger, delta gets arbitrarily smaller, what happens to this inequality? So you will see that it goes to 3n choose n, n, n over 8 times 2n choose n plus 4. And now you can use Stirling's approximation that n factorial is roughly equal to n to the n divided by e to the n. And that gives us that this term over here is 3 to the 3n over 2 to the 2n plus 4. And simplifying this, you get theta of 3 over 2 to the 2 of 3 minus little o of 1 to the 3n. And then, of course, letting k equal 3n, we're able to prove this claim over here. So what do we have now? We have that there are large USPs that satisfy the size, and because of this, we're able to have a matrix multiplication bound that is as low as it is currently. Um, what this means for the future is that if one can come up with larger USPs, we can actually push down the bound of matrix multiplication. And in fact, there is this concept of strong uniquely solvable puzzles um, with additional constraints. And if one can even prove the existence of a strong USP, we can show that the bound of matrix multiplication is of exponent 2. And that would be a very beautiful result. Thank you for listening to my presentation.